I'll get back to where I am. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Natalie Fritz, and I am the archivist and director of collections, outreach, and social media for the Clark County Historical Society. And for the past two years, we've been doing virtual programs um, most of the times, twice a month, to share different topics from our local history. Uh, this is a bit different than what we normally do, um, but it is history that will be, it's stuff today that will be history tomorrow. And uh, Dr. Naravella, uh, like most local doctors throughout local history in our area, is already in our archives. I checked, um, Dr. Naravella, you do have a folder um, in, in our uh, medical history box about uh, what you have done over the years. And um, I wanted to share a little bit of a bio of you so people know um, who, you're, who they're going to be hearing from tonight. Um, so one of your big topics that we'll be talking about tonight is uh, table salt. It was the most widely ignored cause of extensive health problems, specifically affecting the Black America, Black America and is the main reason for disparities in health. Dr. Nara Vetla, a long-term and well-known cardiac surgeon from Springfield, is passionate about changing this one major factor. He has published two books on the subject, which have received high praise. In addition, he has lectured to all types of audiences across America and the globe, appeared on TV, radio, and print news media. Dr. Nara Vetla started the cardiac surgery program in Springfield in 1998. His excellence has earned this program several national recognitions for exceeding many national performance benchmarks. This renowned heart surgeon has been recognized by the Consumer Research Council of America as one of America's top surgeons. You can read many of his blogs at www.saltkills.com and view several specially produced short video clips. Dr. Naravetla's mission is for public service and not for profit. His style of writing uses simple language, specially commissioned creative illustrations and interesting stories all based on sound mainstream research that will leave you convinced and motivated to take better care of yourself. And uh, Dr. Naravetla, I'm really happy to have you here with us today to talk with us. And I feel like this program is kind of penance for, uh, for last month's program where we shared uh, vintage recipes from our archives. We have uh, dozens of cookbooks that have been produced locally and we shared excerpts of recipes from those. And I can assure you that even the ones that were considered heart healthy did not seem to be all that healthy. <laughs> so uh, we, we shared a whole bunch of vintage recipes from the past that probably were, were not so great for people's health. So um, this month we're, we're showing them um, some better ways to do things um, with someone who uh, has, has a long history here in Springfield. So thank you for joining us tonight and I'll, I'll let you take it away. Natalie, uh, thank you so very much for those kind words and nice introduction. I'll have to buy you some coffee someday. And I cannot hear this. I saw you were on. Are you hearing it okay? Can you hear you? Can you hear me? Okay. We, well, then I need a full round we, of this with my speaker we hear. stuff. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> my speaker, okay. you're at Mary. So you, we do hear. <laughs> okay. All right. So if you can hear me, then I'm ready to go. Okay, Natalie? Yes, we hear you. Okay. So thank you again for inviting me on this program and thank you again for a very nice and kind introduction. Uh, true that I'm very interested in prevention of heart disease. And true, I started the heart program two independent locations back in 98. Uh, and uh, our heart program has uh, really earned a lot of national um, recognitions, no doubt about it. But my mission of late has been how to prevent heart disease. I wish I'd gotten into this sooner um, but nevertheless, I did get into it. Uh, about 15 years, I'm working on this. Uh, and about 12 years ago, I finally wrote uh, the, my first book and subsequently second book and a lecture constantly on the subject, try to get people's attention. So I appreciate the opportunity and I hope you all uh, pay attention. As Natalie pointed out, what I'm about to say is completely mainstream medical research opinions and uh, material that is uh, easily available and prevalent in authentic mainstream medical literature. Unfortunately, nobody seemed to follow, including the doctors and many in the medical profession. And they, they take the subject too lightly until bad things happen. Uh, and that's why we got into this mission to explain it in a very simple way. Our mission is explain this complex problem, very simple way, the way you understand. And I hope uh, you will appreciate this presentation. So on the screen, you have two things. Uh, smoking and salt. You all know about smoking. Uh, I hope uh, you all trying to quit smoking, those who are uh, unfortunately started on this. Uh, smoking has been uh, 
uh, a devastating uh, development of our modern civilization. Uh, it affects every part of the body, uh, especially the lungs. And uh, lung cancer is the number one killer of all cancers in men and women. Men and women. Lung cancer kills more women than pretty much all other cancers combined. All the women emotionally and for, uh, for good reason, uh, largely focus on breast cancer and cervical cancer, etc. But lung cancer kills more women also, is the number one killer among all cancers across the world in all populations. So 95% or thereabouts of lung cancer comes only in smokers. Only about 5% or so are random cancers that happen in people who don't smoke. But the vast majority, overwhelming majority of lung cancers happen only in smokers. Just imagine if you never started smoking, 95% of the uh, lung cancer, the number one killer across the world, number one killer in men and women, uh, will disappear, will are gone. Can you imagine 95% of the number one killer among cancers will be gone. So, and everybody understands it to some degree. And now we are trying to very hard to not to smoke. We cannot smoke in any of the hospitals, many establishments you cannot smoke. So we have gained some control of it, not completely, but some control. Of it. And, uh, and we need to do more. I'll tell you, we need to do more. Unfortunately, blue collar still smokes us about the same rate. And we need to improve on that. There's more work to be done. But there is one other problem that we're paying no attention whatsoever. And that is table salt. Table salt actually kills more people than smoking. <clears throat> yes, I said that. Table salt causes more deaths and disabilities than smoking. It's not me saying it. It is World Health Organization saying. On the screen, you have um, the global risk factors for death. Number one is high blood pressure. Number one, high blood pressure. And tobacco comes after that, but there's a significant gap between the two. You can see that. So high blood pressure uh, alone as a, as a uh, consequence of our table salt habit, killing more people and disabling more people than tobacco. And our mission has been to educate doctors, nurses, and general public about this catastrophic problem, which actually can be more easily controlled than smoking. Smoking actually is an addiction. Once you start smoking, quitting is very hard, especially for women. But uh, quitting eating salt is nothing. It's not a chemical addiction. It's a matter of preference and choice. I can, you can switch around just like that, just like that. Once you know how bad salt hurts you, majority of the people can switch like that. There are some who have difficulty, I'll be honest with you. And those who actually have difficulty, just like the guys who have difficulty quitting smoking, they make you believe that, oh, I'm having fun. I'm enjoying life. You are just blind lives, worthless. Life. What's the point of living? without enjoying it. Here I'm enjoying life. Next thing you know, he's on oxygen, he's lost his legs, he's on dialysis, he's enjoying life. But he's gonna bully you and make you believe that you're not enjoying life because you didn't put salt in your food. And don't fall for that. Uh, one thing I have to say, that people who follow any precautions for preventive health are kind of meager, hiding out them. Like, like people are smoking nowadays who, who go somewhere hiding to smoke, the people are following healthy diets doing the same thing. Oh, I don't eat salt. Oh, I eat this. No, stand tall. Stand tall. You're, do, you're doing for your own benefit. You're doing for the benefit of your family and rest of them. If somebody is not able to quit eating salt, don't make him believe you that he's having more fun than you do. No. So you are having a better life than he's had now and for the future. So why? And here is one example. So how many things high blood uh, table salt causes? High blood pressure is just one of them. And the list goes on and on and on. 
and I'll go over some of them. And most recent COVID mortality, uh, type two diabetes, asthma, and dementia are the biggest catastrophic public health problem that's coming around. Renal failure, we all know about. We just about high blood pressure, okay? So this many problems <laughs> affect your body, every part of your body, and more people than tobacco. I'm not saying pay attention to smoking. I mean, uh, eating less salt and don't pay nothing. Don't worry about smoke. No, I'm not saying that. Number one and two public health problems are salt and smoking. If you didn't put, if you didn't smoke, you would have cut out 95% of lung cancer. If you didn't add salt, you would have cut out all these problems. In fact, American Heart Association says 80% of the heart disease is preventable. 80% of heart disease is preventable. I know that doing this day in and day out, and I wish I got engaged into this sooner, but never too late. So for the 15 years I've been preaching mantra, high blood pressure as a cause of heart disease is ignored. High table salt as a cause of many health problems is not getting attention. So that's our mission. And this is how many things we cause. So we'll go over some of these things the way we can understand, okay? Uh, so our mission is to prevent high blood pressure. We need to look at high blood pressure as a preventable disease. We don't look at high blood pressure in that perspective at all. We look at it, high blood pressure, something, we take a pill, everybody takes a pill, I'll take one too, <laughs> and pills add up. You know, by the time you retire, end up in a nursing home, people are taking 20 pills, that's average. That's the Institute of Medicine average. It all started with one pill. When the doctor starts you on a high blood pressure pill, you didn't ask the question, what is high blood pressure? You never ask the question. And you never ask the question, how to get out this pill. You're too happy to just take the pill and continue on. Next thing you know, one becomes two, two becomes three, three becomes five, and goes on and on, you're in 20 pills. You, you just got onto your pill train that is going down, downhill. You just checked in the Roche Mortel, no checkout. High blood pressure makes you a permanent patient for, for the first time. Once you're diagnosed with high blood pressure, you're hooked onto the doctors and medication. And your entire life from there on revolves under doctors and hospitals. People have all kinds of grand ideas. I'm gonna retire in, in uh, uh, Las Vegas and Florida and this and that. Majority of them don't end up doing that because they have to, schedule all their life around doctor's appointments. And that's what you're looking at if you don't control your taste. So high blood pressure must be looked at as a preventable disease. And that's our focus. And we in fact started a thing called uh, Springfield Action to Prevent High Blood Pressure. And I think if you're in Springfield, Ohio, um, vast majority of the people are aware of this mission. I would like to think so. Recently, I went to a restaurant um, uh, over the Easter weekend in, in Dayton, very upscale brunch, uh, fancy place, very high price tag. We'd have, you could have fed half of Springfield for the amount of money we paid for <laughs> one meal. Um, and there the spread was grand, like 25, 30 different items. And talking about the last week's presentation you had, and uh, in spite of the big price tag, me or my family could virtually eat nothing there. Even, even uh, what do you call it, uh, eggs, scrambled eggs were salted. Why would you do that? If somebody wants to salt it, you can do it. So ultimately we could eat nothing. We just ended up eating salad and some uh, fruits, uh, and fruits and some coffee and we left. And the amount of salt in each one of those over the top, not just a little medium salt. Everything you put in your mouth, you just spit it out. That kind of salt. And people not aware. And elderly people, families, uh, um, you know, there is a, a two-week period of time to uh, get an appointment, get a table on in this restaurant. That's such an upscale restaurant. And not aware. People not aware. Restaurants not aware. At least in Springfield, there is some degree of awareness. More so among you know, people who are around me. Uh, when I walk around the hospitals. You know, you see this button here? I have it always, no matter what I do. And people hide things from me. If they're eating something unhealthy, they hide it from me, okay? 
at least they know they're not supposed to eat. Now we have started this mission and there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, people think we need to eat salt to make up our sodium. Yes, human body needs sodium. I get a lot of pushback about this, but you do not need to add table salt to make up that sodium requirement. Here is a picture of many types of mammals, each feeding their baby. And the first one year infancy is the fastest, grow fastest growing period. Babies grow three times the size in that one year alone, just drinking mother's milk. Just drinking mother's milk alone. And the mother's milk has precious little amount of sodium, very little. Still, they don't get hyper low sodium. Big mistake to think that if you don't eat salt, you're going to have low sodium problem. It does happen in some people, okay? I'll tell you that. Most of them are already are suffered the consequences of eating salt all their life. Now they are uh, reach a situation, they need salt sometimes. It's like people who have developed diabetes and they're sometimes going to hypoglycemia and they need to be given glucose. And if you go around saying, I want to eat glucose so I don't become diabetic, it's the wrong way to do it. Then you're certainly going to get on diabetes and you're going to need glucose. It's opposite of what you might be thinking. So if you don't develop diabetes, the likelihood that you will need glucose to save you, you know, very rare. The same way, some people need salt. There's some rare conditions where they have salt losing kidney problems, but the mass majority of the time where you need to supplement salt is in people who are already suffering salt related health problems. So the opposite, the mother's milk of variety of mammals has extremely little sodium. Human milk has 15 milligrams, minuscule amount of sodium. And this is not table salt, okay? In fact, there are 30 plus million different species documented on this face of earth. Not one of them actually adds salt to the diet. And we are the only smart ones who think we need to do that. So we shouldn't stop doing that. And we should not be under the impression that some degree of salt is safe. It may be okay to some extent in some people, but who, uh, to what extent is okay for you, you don't know. And in fact, this doctor was considered a father of hypertension, Dr. Dahl testified in front of Congress in 1969. That's how many years ago? Testified in Congress, human beings do not need to put table salt or sugar in their diet. You should get both of them by natural sources. He testified in Congress and he subsequently died a few years later after, unfortunately. Otherwise, he would have carried the mission a lot further. But the industry ran away with the sugar part. If I am willing to talk about low calorie foods, the industry will be supporting me. They'll send me a personalized, uh, you know, private uh, aircraft and carry me around in limousines and pay big money. If I only would talk about sugar. Why? Because there were thousands of low calorie products already made and they need somebody to market them. But if I talk about salt, no, no. They'll try to marginalize, run over you, crush you over, and find research to counter my positions, et cetera, et cetera. They don't want you to talk about salt. They would want you to talk about sugar. So that is a problem. And uh, there is amount of research out there, unbelievable, that tells you the table salt is a problem. Um, so, there is so much data uh, that tells you that table salt is a problem, uh, thousands and thousands of papers. And in fact, there are 1 billion people around the world with high blood pressure. That's a conservative estimate. And uh, we don't have uh, good control of the um, high blood pressure at all. Nine out of 10 people do not follow salt uh, restrictions and the sources of food uh, are not changing. Okay, and that is not changed. So how do we get our sodium? This is the take home slide, Mix this one and the next one, okay? And what it is is the sodium and potassium content of fruits and nuts. Um, what you see in here in at a glance, I don't need you to, to uh, study this closely, but just at a glance, the sodium content of fruits and nuts, you'll see the so potassium content is very high. 
and sodium content is really small, whether you're talking about natural fruits or not, unsalted versions. So human uh, diet, which you all agree that, should agree that uh, unsalted nuts and fruits are really the basic diet for human beings and has very high amount of potassium and hardly any sodium. And that's our natural source. So unfortunately, regardless of what our economic status is, we don't eat enough fruits or enough nuts. Instead, uh, you put a uh, table salt in anything that you eat. And what happens as a result? The kidney actually gives up at some point. In fact, one professor calculated kidneys being bombarded about 70 times its capability to handle that, 70 times. Just give me one second. Okay, I'm back. Choose water. Is that's a slogan? Choose water instead of uh, salty and sugary things. Choose water. Human body is designed to drink water for thirst, not uh, any other kinds of drinks. So that's the best drink to have. Choose water. So our kidney is being bombarded seventy times on average its ability to handle sodium and it gives up at some point. And when that gives up depends on this graph done by same Dr. Dahl that I just mentioned. It's a graph of salt sensitivity. What he did, he took a bunch of rats and fed them salt. Some of them developed high blood pressure and complications died very quickly. On the red line, he called these rats salt sensitive. On the green side, some of these uh, rats did not develop much problem and um, immediately anyway. Uh, so they were, these ones they called salt resistant. And whether it's salt sensitive or salt resistant gets inherited to the next generation and so on and so forth. So uh, if you're salt sensitive, even a very little bit of sodium is pretty harmful. The salt, I mean, a very little of salt, salt is very harmful. And uh, unfortunately, um, Black America lives here. Majority of the Black America is salt sensitive. And approximately 25% of Caucasians are salt sensitive. Un unfortunately, there's no real test to find out whether you're salt sensitive or not. But if you eat a very salty meal tonight, and next morning, you're up by one or two pounds, or your ring is too tight, your feet are swollen, uh, or you put on, uh, you know, uh, close a little tighter, then you're salt sensitive. But by the time you reach that stage, a lot of damage has already taken place. So the smart idea would be to figure out a way to eat less salty and less salty and no salt. Not take it for granted that you may not be salt sensitive and start enjoying healthy food so you don't have to deal with it. That's a smart play. Not wait until you not you haven't been a visual thinking saying I'm not, I might be salt resistant, so I'll keep eating what I want. So eventually uh, you develop this problem, then it's too late. Now you're you're in you're in Roach Motel, no checking out. Okay. So what would happen if you did cut out salt? And you heard about this bullies will tell you you're having a worthless life, you're not smoking, not eating salt. But study after study shows exactly the opposite. Or in this study, what happened? Some people were off sodium for about three months. And what happened? One out of three got off medications. Would you want to get off the medications you're taking just for the sake of it and the price alone? You want to be off medications. A third of the people got off medications. And four out of five had reduced doses or completely off, four out of five people. Everybody lost weight. And what is even more important, the people who are uh, on this low salt diet, no salt diet, no added, no salt added diet, were happier. Please note, they were happier. 
they were less depressed for taking less pain pills. Exactly the opposite of what you would have think. These people are actually enjoying life. They don't have to see doctors as often. Their energy level is better. They're not spending as much money. They're actually enjoying the food. And you want to be here. And there are many studies to collaborate with. And many people tell me that on, uh, on during my daily rounds, I'm not eating salt, now I'm feeling a lot better. I lost a few pounds. I'm taking two or three medications, very common. I mean, I get stopped at least half a dozen times a day. Somebody tells me this, that I'm not taking this. Now I'm happier. Now I'm taking less medications. Now I'm off the medications. This is amazing. Okay. So you have to put health first. If you put health first, the taste will change. Human beings' taste is very flexible. You're very adaptable. And if you put the priority in the health, taste will change. But if you put the priority on the taste, health always gets compromised. You have to pick your back. So if you put priority on the health, the taste easily changes. Opposite, problem. That's what the society is doing. So let's go to what, what happens when you eat salt. And this is a sponge that I got from Home Depot locally. It has traveled all over the world. And I use this as an example uh, to explain what salt does in your body. Very simple. In fact, sometimes I walk around with this in the hospital uh, or an airport. People think I'm here to clean the table. I said, no, I'm here to explain to you. I was hoping you would ask me the question so I can explain to you why you shouldn't be eating salt. <laughs> so just as a um, icebreaker, so to speak. So what this is, is when you eat salt, Depending on your salt sensitivity level, salt is like a sponge. It retains water. That's how everybody in, in the world who's in into any hospital, in the ICUs, there are water pills. If you go room after room in the hospital, they're all on water pills. Why? They're trying to get rid of the excess water. Why did the excess water come into the body in the first place? Not because you're drinking too much water, People not drinking enough water. But you're retaining water. You're retaining water. And that's how you go. It says water creates all kinds of problems. So you're on water pills. Drug number one in the world, water pill. And that is because salt acts like a sponge. Now, I don't know why, but nobody ever asks what is high blood pressure. You assume you know that what high blood pressure is. So uh, just for the fun of it, when I walk into the hospital and ask a nurse, do you know, can you explain to me, I'm uh, just assume I'm a, a sixth grader, 12 year old kid. And uh, my mom came home saying, the doctor said you have high blood pressure. So I'm shocked. I want to know what high blood pressure is. Can you explain to me at a sixth grade level what it means? Believe me, almost nobody can explain. Nobody is a good idea what high blood pressure is. You automatically assume you know or something you take, you take a pill for and you're good. And that's how like a days ago, the society has become to this catastrophic health problem worse than smoking because we don't care to stop and ask what is high blood pressure. We don't care to stop and say, could I prevent high blood pressure? And let me explain to you what high blood pressure is. So I'm going to use just my hands. I hope you can see it. Raise your hand if you can see it. You can see my hands? Anybody who can see my hands? Please raise your hand. Okay. Okay. So on my right hand is my heart pumping. My heart pumping at least 60 times a minute. Most people are higher, but at least that. 60 times a minute, every second, every second, from the birth to until you are six feet under, your heart is pumping nonstop, nonstop. It's pumping blood, it's pumping blood. So where is the blood going into? Where is the blood pumping, being pumped into these arteries about this size? Heart pumps, 
into these arteries. What is an artery? It carries blood like pipes from the heart to all over the body, to carrying oxygen and nutrients to all over the body through system of, our, of uh, arteries like, uh, like road map, roads, goes all over the place. The heart is pumping blood into these arteries. So there's something very interesting happens with each and every heartbeat. Heart pumps, the artery relaxes to receive the blood each and every time. Heart pumps, the artery relaxes. And when the heart relaxes, the artery, when the heart relaxes, the artery goes down. So with each heartbeat, the artery is going up and down, up and down like this. That's what a pulse that you feel. So the artery relaxes each and every time the heart is pumping blood. No mistake. Every time heart is pumping blood, the artery is relaxing. There's a divine romance, dances with stars extremely coordinated, synchronized movement going on between the heart and the arteries to that receive blood. Between the heart that pumps blood and the arteries that receive blood. This is an extremely coordinated action going on. The moment you have high blood pressure, what it means is that the heart is pumping blood, but the artery is not relaxing enough. The artery is offering resistance. Heart is pumping, artery doesn't relax as much as it should. The artery has lost its elasticity. Your arteries are not as elastic as they should be anymore. And the heart pumps, the artery doesn't relax as much as it do. So instead of going a divine romance, you're doing this. The arteries, if there's a battle going on between the heart, and the arteries that won't want to receive it. The arteries do not want to receive as much blood. The heart is trying to force the blood through it. So there is this battle going on between us. So instead of a divine romance, synchronized dance, now you have a, this one, okay? And so you started a battle instead of you. Your arteries don't relax as much anymore. It's a catastrophic development. You cannot take it cavalier or like a desical, like I can take a pill, that'll be fine. No. So all the blood pressure medication does two things. One, they get rid of the water, so the volume is less. And the other thing is they try to relax the arteries. There are hundreds of different medications that try to relax the arteries, different combinations. So you start at a battle between a heart and the blood vessels. You did it yourself. Most of us do it yourself. And there's a battle going on between the heart and the blood vessels. In this battle, unfortunately, nobody wins. In this battle, neither the heart wins nor the arteries win. The heart loses this battle and the arteries lose this battle. Both of them are lost. And this is a battle created by ourselves, by our own lack of understanding, our own not understanding that high blood pressure is preventable. Our own inability to understand that high blood pressure is a catastrophic health problem. And we need to look at it as, as a battle that we created inside our body that shouldn't have started in the first place. And in this battle, no dominance, nobody's going to win. It's a lose-lose battle. And this battle could be prevented. That's the way we need to look at it. And that's the way we need to look at it. And we lost the elasticity of the arteries. They're not as relaxing anymore, become tight. And that's what high blood pressure is. Your arteries are not relaxing like the way they're supposed to. And you need to look at that as an extremely catastrophic dull. And I tell you how. So the blood's supposed to go smooth. Instead, it becomes very turbulent because on this flight, And what happens with this turbulence? I'll give you many examples, how the arteries and the blood vessels lose. Here's an example of an artery that goes to your brain. This red one, here is a head, it goes to the brain. And as it goes up here, it folds into two right here. And cholesterol builds here and causes strokes, dementia. 
all those things and see what happens here this is a picture of the blockage in that artery see right here where the arrow points to and this is the artery pumping blood forks into two and right is a like a 90% blockage right at the fork and look what we got out of this we got out something like this one there cholesterol plaque and you think it's a cholesterol problem no and here's an example of a blockage we call it a widow maker blockage i hope you can see this there's a blockage right here there's a picture of the arteries of the heart there's a blockage in the very main artery this is the main road carrying blood to the heart muscle and right here is a blockage right where the artery is going to three way trifurcation the blockage is right there the question to be asked that has not been asked is why did the blockage build here only if it is a cholesterol problem if it is a cholesterol problem why it is not built all over the place only here like if it is raining it rains everywhere like if it is sunshine outside it is sunny everywhere but why only here if it is a cholesterol problem it should be all over the place but why it builds in particular spots we missed that question just like we didn't ask why high blood pressure we didn't ask this question why my artery is blocked here it's because as you can see in this picture the heart pumps blood it comes up this way and hits this junction when it hits junction if you drive me a car when you hit a four you can slow down and pick one but the blood has already left the building okay and it cannot slow down so he hits this junction and causes a scratch 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 every heartbeat scratch scratch it can get slow cannot slow down it's like tiger woods he was going down on that uh, uh whatever that meandering road and he didn't slow down and hit the curb and went over the road same thing happening here so when the blood comes up here and hits this trifurcation big turbulence right here big turbulence right here so when you have high blood pressure you saw the sponge and if you saw the sponge on the other side there was a scratch pad it was by design one was this side the other one was on that side the scratch pad effect is every time the blood hits this fork it is scratching on the inside of the artery scratch 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 24/7 60 times a minute thousands and thousands of times so the damage takes place on inside of the artery just like you're driving a car too fast for the road you're going to hit the curb it's going to hit the wall it's going to hit the retaining wall whatever it is and that's what happen in our body in multiple locations wherever there is branching wherever there is artery is bent etc etc so right there you're getting artery scratched once it gets scratched once the artery is damaged cholesterol builds on those locations layer after layer layer after layer layer after layer and it becomes like a hard rock over time and that's what we see and we assume that cholesterol pill will solve the problem no it does not taking cholesterol pill has benefits especially if you already had a heart attack or a stroke but not as much as you might think let me also tell you that if you don't quit smoking there is not enough medicine we can give you that will undo the damage the smoking does there are plenty of medication they all try to help you but nothing takes the place of not smoking totally same applies to high blood pressure no matter how many pills you take there's nothing like not having high blood pressure it's nothing like it getting off the high blood pressure pills we cannot make up for either smoking or eating salt we just cannot that's how you keep on trying and trying you start with one pill end up with 20 pills along the way you have all kinds of procedures all kinds of headaches all kinds of problems and all the list that we talk so we need to stop high blood pressure so this is what happens to arteries and guess what happens to the, to the heart itself so we said it's a lose lose battle right and the heart is pumping all the time right 
and is pumping against resistance, higher and higher resistance. So it's like working out, it's working out. So higher the resistance, the more working out it does, like you're crunching your biceps, biceps curls. So what happens, your muscle grows. If you go to the gym and lift dumbbells, your muscles grow. Just twice a week, 20 times a, minute, a, a, a time, the heart, that muscle grows, that's all it takes. But your heart muscle is doing almost nonstop. So as a result, your heart muscle grows and becomes big. And this is a very thick heart muscle. It's a very thick heart muscle. You see this all the time. Your heart is supposed to be like a football and it becomes like a baseball, hard rock. It becomes round like this. This is enlarged heart. This is big heart. I got a big heart, not a good thing. If you are philosophically have a big heart, it's a good thing. But if you really truly have a big heart in the size of the heart, that's bad. That is where the heart loses the battle. Okay? So let me explain this. What happens to the heart when the heart becomes big? Okay? The heart loses the capacity to relax just the way the, the arteries are not relaxing anymore. The heart muscle becomes thick, is not able to relax. Still pumps. Oh, good squeezing function. My heart squeezes good, but it doesn't relax. So what does that mean? So it causes a type of heart failure that we see so common over this. In fact, the most common heart failure is this enlarged heart. So how does it work? Let me explain in a golfing terms, okay? So pumping action is when the golfer actually hits the ball forward motion. The relaxing action is when the golfer takes his golf club way back, backswing. You gotta take a backswing to hit forwards. Backswing, hit. Backswing, hit. But for some reason, your backswing is limited. Let's say this golfer here, he swings the ball right about here and it goes however far, okay? But for whatever reason, we say you cannot take your backswing this far out. You can only take up to horizontal level. I made the rule because I own the club. And then what? Then if you take the same swing at the ball, the ball is not going to go as far. You all agree? The ball is not going to travel as far. And sometimes you try to hit harder, squeeze harder. My heart is squeezing good, squeezing harder to make up for the fact that it cannot relax. So the ball cannot go. That's heart failure. And as time goes on, your backswing goes lower and lower to the point you're just putting. You can no backswing, just putting. That means you're in the green. You're not, not in the golf course. So what does that mean in real terms? When your backswing is limited to say about this level, you're in early stage of heart failure. And at that point, you, can, uh, you feel a little tired. Your energy level is lower than it used to. You may not be able to climb stairs that easily and you're not able to do things that you used to do before. And you tell yourself, I'm older now. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I can't do things that I used to do before. You think that's a part of aging process. Most people think that. But that is actually the earliest stage of heart failure, first stage. And as it advances further, you do fewer and fewer things. And by the time you start developing swelling, shortness of breath, then you are partying. At that stage, you're in the bedroom and you can barely go to the bathroom, bedroom, kitchen. That's, that's your world. It's like the putting green. That's all you can do. That's the advanced heart failure. Your legs are swollen. There are water pills. There are many other pills. So at this stage, often the hospital, you get admitted to the hospital and we give a boatload of water, medic, water pills and we give this and the other medications, get you out of heart failure and we push you back to stage two or stage one and you feel better for a while and you come back three months later and keep on going round and round. We call them round trippers. We call them round trippers. You keep on coming back. And that's how you live, live the rest of your life and see you have advanced heart failure, which is preventive. So this is how the heart loses this battle that we started between the heart and the blood vessels that are not relaxing enough and too much volume. And and this battle, you got heart attacks, strokes, and everything else from blocked arteries and heart failure, kidney failure, etc. 
and from this artery not relaxing, you got heart failure. And this is what you have to look forward to. If you don't think you can change your diet, that's what's going to happen. And so um, heart failure is a very, very common problem. In fact, the number one reason for hospital admission nowadays in seniors. So that is preventable. So one other thing that caught my eye that I'm going to share with you is diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And I've written about it quite a bit. And you people think that getting diabetes related to eating too much uh, sugar and calories. Maybe, but what is interesting is that um, I've often found that people who develop type 2 diabetes uh, later years of life uh, already have high blood pressure for two, three decades. Then they develop they type 2 diabetes. You hardly ever find somebody who has type 2 diabetes who doesn't have high blood pressure for some time. And I wondered about this, what is this connection? Why is somebody, everybody who has type 2 diabetes has high blood pressure? Very rarely you see without. And you see lots of people with high blood pressure who don't have diabetes yet. But, but if you have high blood pressure for enough number of years, you're eventually going to develop type 2 diabetes. That's what I'm finding. out. So what's the connection to that? I was just wondering. So this research came from Vanderbilt University published a few years back recently. What they found is that you keep on eating salt, you reach a point that you're not drinking enough water anyway, right? So you eat salt, you have to drink something to compensate. That's the way it is. But it turns out over time, you don't drink enough water, but you make your own water to compensate for it. Yes. We make our own water to some extent to compensate for the excess salt. How do you make that water? So here it is. I'll try to explain this complex reaction. Here is a glucose molecule, unit of glucose, combines with oxygen. We all know that. When we breathe constantly, nonstop, you're breathing oxygen and excreting, getting rid of carbon dioxide. We're breathing in oxygen to produce energy, and we're breathing carbon dioxide that is a byproduct of this energy cycle. It's like the engine, we feed, we, we feed gas, the engine runs, we eat the exhaust, carbon dioxide. So consumption is oxygen and exhaust is carbon dioxide. We are using glucose as a fuel to produce energy to run the machine. But one thing we didn't pay attention is that every time a glucose molecule is reacting with oxygen, it not only produces carbon dioxide, it actually also produces water. We have known this in, even in high school, this reaction produces water. In fact, human body by itself, just the fact that we live and breathe around produces about 300 cc of water by itself. That may not be enough. That's why we need to drink water, but it does produce water itself. But to produce this water, it has to break down this glucose. And what happens if you keep eating salt, keep eating salt, the human body breaks down more glucose to get more water. More glucose than necessary to just to get water. And to break this more glucose, we keep producing more steroids. More steroids just to get more water. Keep on producing more steroid, more steroid over time, you become diabetic. Just like you keep eating salt, keep eating salt, you develop high blood pressure. If we keep getting more steroid, more steroids, you get diabetes, type two. That's basically what happens. So if you want to stop diabetes, you must, type two diabetes, you must first stop high blood pressure. You can get, kill two birds with one. But if you think by drinking low calorie things, you're going to beat this, no. You won't beat diabetes or high blood pressure actually, and, not, and, and you're not going to lose weight either. It's a lose-lose. Everything is lose. The only one wins is the company that makes us. So diabetes, you know, affects the whole body. If you want to stop that, we need to, stop with high, we need to start with high blood pressure. The last item I want to discuss is about uh, weight. Obesity. You know, America is suffering this problem, right? Especially Black America. So it turns out 
that if you cut salt in your diet, you're more likely to lose weight than just about any other plant that you have. There's so many diets out there. You get on it, you get off it. People go through expensive, complex surgeries even, and it fails in most of play, when a large majority of the people sooner or later because they don't follow salt reduction. So what happens with salt reduction? First thing that happens is your portion size goes down. You're, you're, you're not retaining water. Portion size goes down. How does it go down? There's a stop sign in your brain. Every time you eat something, even your most favorite item, let's say you like bananas, give an example. You eat one or two, you're full. You may still be hungry, but you cannot eat any more bananas. There's a stop sign that tells you that. But you eat potato chips or unsalted nuts, unsalted potato chips, a certain amount, you cannot eat anymore. There's a stop sign in your brain. And just like the advertisement says, you cannot stop with one of your chips, few of your chips, you keep on eating. But if you salt the potato chips or salt your peanuts, there's no stop sign. The stop sign disappears. You keep on eating more and more and more. That's what the industry hates us. They want to sell more and more product. Our entire you know, legal system, Congress, for example, uh, uh, they're all under the control of um, processing industry. They don't have the um, will or power to fight the plastic industry to pass legislation. Actually, more than 100 countries in the world have passed legislation to reduce salt in content of the food. And we in America are not able to do that. Only New York City has passed a legislation to put on the, in the menu how much salt there is in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the restaurant menu. Only city to have, be able to do that. No other place able to do that. I fought our own city to do that. Our city is willing to do that. However, they told us it's not in your hands. The state has to make the rules. The state said, we agree in principle what you want need to do, but we don't have the votes. I met like 50 different United States congressmen, majority of them from Congressional Black Caucus, who are the most affected by this. They all sympathize with this, but they say we don't have the votes for it. That's the state of affairs. So we need to in, involve in grassroots education. That's what I'm trying to do. And those who listen to this lecture, share this information, and, and this is the only way we can going to protect ourselves. So the stop sign, this is where the industry comes. They don't want the stop sign so that they can sell more product. So there's a stop sign. First of all, if you don't eat salt, you lose water retention. You lose excess water in your body. Actually, you lose pounds and pounds, just like that in a matter of days, from the, all the water gone, okay? And over time, smaller portion size will fill you up. You're eating less and you're full. You're happy. Industry doesn't want to hear that. So because of the, and then once you get used to this, nobody has to tell you. Just for the taste alone, you're eating less salt or no salt. And every recipe in the restaurant that we went to over the weekend can be made with, or, with or little or no salt and still taste as good. If you're a chef worth your salt, so to speak, a professional chef or a cook at home, I would challenge you to spend time making food with little or no salt and make it tasty. And you can do that. Experiment with it. Your, your, your health and your family's wealth health depends on it. There are many things you can do. I'll give you examples. Uh, there are so many spices. Ginger, garlic, cilantro, lime and lemon. The go-to thing, lime and lemon. If your food tasting too bland, instead of putting salt shaker, put lime and lemon on the table. Don't go for salt, sea salt. Sea salt is a trick. It's a, devil, it's a devil's trick. It is the same as a regular salt. Don't fall for it. Himalayan salt, pink salt, kosher salt, all those are the same. So lemon juice, lime juice. For most people, it, it gives enough tangy taste that you don't miss salt. And there are thousand different spices. Experiment with those things. Use more unsalted vinegar, uh, for example. Use more green chilies, more red chilies, uh, green peppers. There are many other things that give flavor. And you realize that the natural flavor is tastier than all these other things. And incorporate more fruits and nuts into your diet. If you can do that, it can be done and blood pressure is prevented. 
and you don't have to deal with all these things. Even if you're on three medications, it will come down on two, maybe two, maybe two to one, one to nothing. It can happen and it does happen. So, you know, you need to get your heart out of the sand. I tell my doctor's friends all the time. And we need to walk the walk. I tell them that. And don't treat your body as a trash can. So with that, I'm going to stop my presentation. And uh, uh, I would entertain any questions. I've got time if you want to uh, ask any questions. There are a lot, lot of topics. This can go on and on for a long time. But I want to hit uh, two or three important points that I want you to make understand what high blood pressure is, what damage it does inside the body, and where high blood pressure comes from. So with that, I will stop. And you can open it up for conversation. What does exercise impact? Exercise is good. Um, but best exercise starts in the kitchen. Just like you cannot compensate for smoking by any medication, you cannot compensate by for wrong food by any exercise. You have to exercise. Uh, moderate exercise, I would say, walking, um, uh, low-level uh, stationary bicycle. Most of cardiac patients, I recommend a stationary bicycle if you, that you can do at home all the time. Uh, that you do, here is the limit. I'm glad you asked this question. How much exercise should do? I have a heart surgery done. I'm diagnosed heart failure. I'm going to rehab. Should I be jogging in the park? No. Uh, so moderate exercise, what does moderate exercise mean? It means uh, you should be able to maintain a conversation when you are doing exercise. If you're not able to maintain the conversation, that's too much work. If you're starting to sweat, it's too much work. So uh, what I recommend is have yourself a stationary bicycle, the, the kind that has a back like this, that you can recline and hold the sidebars, and watch your TV or whatever, and pedal at a slow fashion, at your comfort level, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. At your own pace, you're racing with nobody. Okay, and if you can do that, if you're monitoring the heart rate, don't let it go over 120. And if you're, if you're exercising at a rate of 100, that's fine. Uh, at an even rate, that's fine. So exercise uh, does a lot of good things. Exercise helps bones, exercise helps lose weight, Exercise helps cardiac health, but will not take the place of taking a proper diet. Will not. Just like no pill will make up for not quitting smoking or quitting salt. Unfortunately, a lot of young people, especially, I have exercised today. I was on a treadmill for one hour, so I'm going to, I'm entitled to two donuts or I'm entitled to an ice cream. They, they feel entitled to some bad food. So exercise has been a failure. It helped many uh, shoe companies and many exercise equipment companies. They're laughing all the way to the bank. But in every home in America has a shoe store. We got black shoes, white shoes, green shoes. We got uh, walking shoes, running shoes, jogging shoes, golf shoes, ten tennis shoes. Everybody has this many shoes. And then every home has exercise equipment in the basement or somewhere. And just use as a, they use it as a coat hanger. But especially treadmill, least utilized machine. Because most people with knee problem or ankle problem cannot do that. And if you don't have them, if you keep doing treadmill, you'll eventually get them. So no, you end up not using it. So don't spend your money in treadmill. Buy a medium range stationary bicycle. Don't have near, near too many bells and whistles. It's a simple, good functioning uh, exercise, a stationary bicycle. And that's the best way to maintain your cardiovascular health. I hope I answered that question. Yes, okay. Uh, Dr. Naravel, I have a question um, yes. about no salt um, spices. Like I, okay. I actually, I use one that's called no salt salt. And yeah. that's what, that's what I use so, in place of salt. Is that, is that something that no. is, no, is it still salt? It is actually potassium salt. I don't recommend it. So the only salt substitute in the market that I would recommend is uh, Mrs. Dash. Mrs. Dr. Dash. <clears throat> Dr. Naravet, <clears throat> I don't know whether I'm coming through or not. 
Um, yes, you are. Okay. I noticed. Let me that, let me finish uh, that question. Question. So, Mrs. Dash is not salt, but is uh, herbs mixed in such a way to taste like salt. There is a company that I recently came across uh, in uh, Miamisburg. I think it's called SpiceX. Uh, I have to confirm that. And actually, they send me these uh, spices. They're like uh, Mrs. Dash. They make all these variety of different spices um, uh, that are not salt. They're all um, herbs mixed in a, in a certain way to make them. So uh, I've not tested them enough, but Mrs. Dash has been tested enough. It is a product I can endorse. I cannot endorse no salt. I cannot endorse any salt substitutes. Uh, certainly not uh, sea salts, okay? Uh, so that is that question. Uh, Mary Ann, you can go ahead next. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is about the water uh, that you were drinking. You drank what bottled water. And I believe in drinking the regular city water myself uh, instead of bottled yes. water. And I wanted to know why you choose the bottled water over our city water. Well, at home, I drink bottled water, uh, city water. And uh, uh, it in the hospitals, basically pretty much you have no choice. I'm still in the hospital. I'm still working, by the way. <laughs> So, well, does uh, the bottled water have less sodium in it than our? our no, I don't. Uh, no, no, I don't think that's the reason. Um, but bottled water is not good for many reasons. One of them is this waste, plastic waste. Yeah. Uh, other one is uh, um, they, they, they are, we don't know where this water came from and what's the natural composition of it. Okay. And uh, uh, if you have a good city water, in Springfield City, we need to add fluoride. We don't have that, okay? We have been, the fluoride, fluoride campaign has going on for years and the city, people vote it out every single time. So there's no fluoride, okay? The Springfield City water is no fluoride, but maybe a little fluoride. But other than that, I don't have a problem with the city of Springfield water. So I, I would encourage in drinking city water. I use city water to cook and do everything, okay? But only yeah. when I'm traveling, and when I'm in the hospital, though, this is the only water available, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, that's what I do. So I don't necessarily endorse it, but I'm endorsing the water. Okay. I just am a strong proponent of Springfield City water. I think we got the best water in Ohio here. And uh, I like to drink just a glass of water, preferred over a plastic bottle of water. <laughs> yeah, at home we drink straight um, water. And we use the straight water for all of our cooking preparations. Yes. Thank you for uh, that uh, uh, that uh, plug-in. Yes, absolutely agree with you. Okay. There you go. Yeah, doctor. Uh, my question is: uh, over the last twenty years, I've had blood tests every six months, uh, and uh, the the criteria for what sodium levels are in relationship to those blood tests. Uh, differ, I guess, from maybe even what you stated in your book and information that I've gotten. Can you kind of tell us where the federal government is when they set the standards for sodium and blood versus what maybe you recommend? Oh, no, my recommendation is not my own. It is recommended by American Heart Surgeons, American Heart Association. So um, and let, maybe I should put this slide up uh, so I can find it. Um, so American Heart Association states, um, stay below 1500 milligrams of salt, 1500. 1500, American Heart Association, American Heart Association or any other organization doesn't say you need 1500 milligrams. That's a big mistake. Everybody makes. Mm. Okay. Okay. It's not like you need vitamin C this much, you need uh, B12 this much, you don't need this much salt. No, it is a limit sign. It's a not a you need sign. It's a limit sign. People misinterpret this all the time. Okay. American Heart Association specifically said there's enough sodium in anything that you eat for a vast majority of the population. They don't suffer sodium, uh, um, um, what do you call low sodium problem at all. There is a minority. It's not a public health problem that, that we don't actually recommend that you add salt. That is American Heart Association. Interesting. But when you add salt, stay under 1,500 milligrams. 
American Heart Association recommendation trumps everything else. You know why? American Heart Association is the largest, biggest nonprofit organization. It is not a government organization. It's called, it's called American, yet it is a worldwide organization. And their goal is only simple and straightforward, prevent heart disease and strokes. That's their mission, nothing else. Okay. It's a totally non organization. So you should look at American Heart Association recommendation as your number one uh, source of information. If you have any question about any drugs, medications, uh, diet, et cetera, et cetera, put that question and look up what American Heart Association says about it. Mm-hmm. Not somebody trying to sell you something. Okay. okay? Uh, American Heart Association doesn't have anything to sell except to protect, uh, you know, prevent heart disease and strokes. So what I have on the screen is a blood pressure criteria, okay? So here it is, blood pressure 90 over 60. If you never ate salt in your life, this is based on multiple population studies, your blood pressure would be 90 over 60. People tell me, I'm told my doctor says, I'm suffering from low blood pressure. So what do you mean is suffering for liberal? You look fine. You're talking, walking, doing, doing everything you need to do. You're not suffering. That's your blood pressure. Mm. Something, same thing applies sometimes to sodium. There is lots of people out there whose sodium is a little lower than average. They're doing fine with it. But your blood pressure normally runs 120 and suddenly it is 70. That's a problem. If your sodium normally runs 140, and today is 120, that's a problem. Okay, so uh, so you set your own, what is normal for you is. When you're doing all right, when you're feeling all right, doing all right, functioning all right, that's normal for you, okay? And uh, when you are feeling symptoms, are you feeling symptoms? It's just a lab test showing something. So let's say you're, uh, you're normally run sodium of 140, and today you went for a blood test and it's 135 and you're feeling fine, that's okay. And it may be 130, still may be okay. But if you're feeling symptoms and your sodium is below 130, that may be a problem, okay? So you have to match that, you have to match that. And there are a lot of people around the world fully functioning with blood pressure well below 100. And in fact, this graph shows if you don't ever eat salt, your blood pressure never goes up through your entire life. Mm. And most people think as I grow older, blood pressure not automatically goes up anyway. No, it doesn't. That has to do with salt. Okay. This is a study sponsored by American Heart Association and National Institute of Health and many other organizations. This is a study that I have you on the screen. Not me. It's not my opinion. Okay. And this is called interest. Yeah, this is called intersol study. Okay, it came from that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. So my recommendations do not differ from what you think uh, other uh, recommendations are. No, my recommendation based on completely authentic uh, American Heart Association, National Institute of Health, and many other organizations. And you cannot find a single organization tell you that you need to do salt. They all tell you to stay under a certain limit. There are papers suggesting that maybe you should eat salt, but not being endorsed by any organization. Okay. Uh, that was a great question, by the way. Thank you. If you are, if I see you in person, I would have given you a, a book just for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, moving along. Well, um, I just, I, 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 my question is, I, I, so I, I'm, I'm a working mom with young kids. I work here. Um, often on days like today, I pick up fast food on my way home, and then I come back here to do programs like this. Um, we need, obviously need to find better options, but I found that a lot of the frozen options and faster options, even if you can make them at home. Are all, all have a lot of sodium in them. Like, why do why do frozen dinners have so much sodium? Yeah, you've seen that salty six. You should look at salty six. Okay, have you seen that thing? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll do the okay. search for you. 
I hope you can see the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to Google. I'm on Google. You see that? You all can see? Mm -hmm. Okay. I say salt T6. Okay. Salt T6. And you see these pictures? And this is by American Art Association. Six, this American Art Association, don't get mad at me. Six items. People don't even realize you're consuming a lot of salt. You should print this and put it on your refrigerator and your, on your coffee table, on your front door. If you walk through the front door with any of these six items, you're not my friend. Okay? So, yes, you're right. And uh, working moms uh, on travel, it is a challenge. But more and more, um, I find I do the shop, grocery shopping for my family quite often, actually. Uh, in addition to the fruits and nuts, you should, you should uh, incorporate a variety of unsalted nuts in your daily diet, which I do regularly. And uh, even my office, my uh, car, my travel bag has nuts, okay? And uh, um, so um, if, you try, if you look around, the more and more uh, unsalted versions are available in, the, in Kroger's, for example. Uh, beans, tomatoes, um, canned tomatoes, canned beans, chickpeas, uh, variety of nuts, um, and I find more and more items. And you should uh, just take a little time to look for those. And when you go home, fix those things with without uh, salt added and add lime and lemon. It's healthy for you and also tastes like salt. And incorporate more ginger garlic, uh, incorporate more cilantro, uh, things like that. They, as uh, healthy living is not expensive, it's a big mistake. Just get, get, get creative. So our family has gone salt free for 15 years now. And uh, we are from uh, part of an India, it like being from the South, Cajun cooking, extremely salty cooking, extremely spicy cooking. But now if you come to our house, I need one of our preparation. In fact, uh, one time we did, my daughter did a demonstration at Federal United, she made a whole um, bowl of, uh, um, butternut squash soup without any salt and put it there and, and it, got, it went, it finished in no time. And nobody knew that there was no salt in it, okay? And my daughter created a, a entered a, com, what is that, uh, chili competition in the, in the hospital. Uh, her recipe was absolutely no salt and it took second place out of 40 recipes. Second place, no salt. Big mistake to think. So if you come and eat our food, you cannot tell there's no salt. In fact, uh, our family back on home from India who are visiting or around the country come to visit us at times and they eat our food, they can't tell there's no salt. It's a huge mistake to think you need to have salt to make it taste. You just have to try. So salt is six. And I give uh, this paper to everybody I come across. Every patient in our, in our practice gets this paper. And people think I am the one doing it. No, I'm not the one doing it. I'm a food soldier for American Art Association and many other organizations trying to... American Art Association doesn't have the money and uh, doesn't have the uh, creative talent uh, to fight the um, celebrities always advertising salty things. No, it doesn't. And I write about it all the time in my blogs. I call them on the carpet. You should look at uh, my blogs. And my writings, I've, uh, we have made quite a few changes, got their attention. For example, you don't see a single per a fortune fire and company advertising, actually saying sea salt is good for you. They don't because we took a, spent a $5,000 issue, issued a press release calling Costco on the carpet for misleading the consumers and nobody recommend, nobody advertised, but the battle is not won. You know why? They came up with a creative way to, to sell the same product, now made with sea salt. Make you believe it is better. And huge number of celebrity chefs and, uh, and uh, start using sea salt, so it tastes better. Everybody's got brainwashed in thinking. Have you read anywhere from any medical organization tell you sea salt is better for you? No. Even though the information is at our fingertips, we don't take the time to look it up. We are too easily brainwashed. 
So that's unfortunately, they know that. They know how to get brainwashed. Dr. Nina Bedlove, yes. about two years ago, you saved my life. You removed a tumor from my heart. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm tumor lady. You're looking uh, good. Just recently, yes, I was in the hospital getting knee replacement and I elected to um, stay over and go into the ac acute rehabilitation yeah. meeting okay. to get okay. started. I okay. thought the hospital food tasted good, but I thought it was salty. Yes, it is. Compared to what Strong I was doing. The, the hospitals, uh, <laughs> uh, what they do is they contract out to these companies. Uh, they don't actually make them in the hospital. You know, I've been fighting this for so long now. Our uh, Springfield Regional Hospital's uh, food is less salty than most places, but still salty now. And uh, if you choose uh, low salt, unsalted versions, they don't really like you. And they try to undermine you somewhere, there, unfortunately. So there's no, you better get out of the hospital soon. You can. Hospital is not a good place to be unless you have to. Yeah. People sometimes treat hospital as a, as a hotel. You can check in and as long as my insurance company pays, I can stay in there. No, don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. Yeah. Thank but you. Thank you for that uh, plug. Thank you very much. All right. Anybody else? Yes, I have a question about hereditary. Um, is, does that impact your blood pressure? And yes, what, yes, what does stress do? Stress. Stress is an important factor in uh, um, in many things, including high blood pressure. Okay, uh, unfortunately, it is true. But uh, surprisingly, stress also uh, makes you retain water. That's how I, high blood pressure is caused. Uh, and trying to avoid stress causes more stress. So you try to figure out how to manage stress. Um, in that regard, uh, you know, uh, in, I, I cannot offer easy solutions to the stress management, but there's so many programs out there. Uh, but meditation is one of the best things. Visit your local church, spend time in there, uh, do charity work. Uh, those are things that, uh, so for example, you know, I'll tell you my own example. So uh, before I got on this, I used to hurt all over the place. I don't know if you can guess how old I am, but uh, um, uh, if you go to any hospital and go to the surgeons or, or nurses uh, locker room, every single locker room has bottles and bottles of uh, ibuprofen everywhere. If you tell I'm hurting my back and need ibuprofen, 20 nurses will give ibuprofen or they don't stop. So I myself used to uh, consume two to 300 ibuprofen for, for a week. Every time I come out of surgery, I'm hurting here and there. I take I don't like anybody else. Okay. So now, if I take one ibuprofen in a month, it's a lot. I virtually don't take the ibuprofen or any other pain medication. So I'm still able to function at a high level, 10 to 12 hours of surgery. How am I able to do that? Two things I do. I spend my morning before I go to work doing a brief meditation. I set my stage for the day. I set the stage emotionally for the day by doing that. Time out. You call it, call it, if you don't like the word meditation, call it time out. You can do that in the morning. You can do it in a number of times during the day. Um, some breathing exercises, they help you with the time out. And uh, then the other thing I do is I do stretch before I leave home. Uh, each one needs to do the, your own variety of stretches. You don't have to spend half an hour on one hour. Just some basic four or five stretches. Each one is different. I don't leave home without stretching unless I'm in an emergency. And even in the hospital, I try to stretch. And in between, I stretch. So if you stretch before we start working, just like they as professional athletes do, they spend a lot of time stretching before they keep going to the game. And after they play the game, also they stretch. It's not, not, it doesn't require pills. So by doing the combination of do these two things, I'm totally able to avoid making any pain pills. What should never take? So that is my personal experience with stress management. And stress does cause a lot of things, aches and pains, high blood pressure, many other things. So that is uh, 
but doesn't no excuse for eating unhealthy i'm stressed out so i'm going to eat ice cream not a good strategy okay all right anything else it seems to me that um one of the things i'm taking out of this is that we need to be slower shoppers in the grocery store and pay more attention to the contents of what we're buying and you know most of the items you buy have a, a list of contents um, and it'll say how much sodium is in a, a product or how much potassium is in it or whatever. And, and I think that's an important thing for shoppers to pay attention to to help us uh, stay on a low sodium diet. Yes, indeed. I hope you got the message that sodium is not a, salt is not a required item in your diet. No. It's a stay below the number item. Don't exceed the number item. Okay. Uh, I never put salt on our table. Um, you know, whatever is naturally the way I fix it. And I, I don't use a lot of salt okay. in my cooking. Good so, for you. Um, and I don't put you salt a cooking on demonstration. Table, so you can't add it later. You know? <laughs> yeah, you can always add it later, right? So that's my petition to the restaurants. Yeah. Why do you put so much salt in this thing? Okay. Uh, I tell them you make the same dish without it. To those who want to add, they can add it. But you cannot take it away once it's already in. So that's what you have in the hospitals, restaurants, everywhere else. So I have a restaurant petition on my uh, website. You can please uh, look at it. Saltkills.com. Go through the, some of the blogs and uh, join in the mission. So I've got these three by five cards that I, you've seen one of those. So if I hear somebody, I walk around, I see somebody uh, drinking water, I give them a gold star. So you are uh, helping prevent heart disease and many other things that come from salt. I hope I can see that. So if I see somebody walking around with a, a soda pop, I give a same card with the same thing, but the front says, don't do it yourself. <laughs> okay, with a, Uncle Sam pointing a finger, okay? And when I go to a restaurant, I give the same thing. Salt does this many problems, and please do something to not hurt your customers. So please give it to your chef, uh, to your chef and see what he can make for, uh, for dinner. For example, I go to the Mela in um, Marriott. The moment I sit there, they know I'm there, and um, the chef makes me uh, without salt food, okay? Uh, even if you're doing fast food, uh, you you can uh, actually, let's say you're getting French fries, not my favorite item, but you tell them I want a fresh batch of French fries and I don't want any salt in it, they are required to make it for you. Okay? Mm -hmm. Don't accept that. You may have to wait a few minutes so that they, uh, they make a new batch, but don't compromise. They will make it. McDonald's or any other fast food, they will make unsalted French fries. You go to uh, uh, restaurants like um, um, Mexican restaurants, they make a, um, what is that, uh, guacamole, and they already salted. I said, I want guacamole, but don't salt it. So they'll make a fresh batch for you. Insist on that. Don't hurt me, okay? Sometimes they give some pushback, but most of the places in town will make it for you. You go to a Japanese place, you eat, uh, they are very salty food. Edamame, no salt. Very tasty, very filling. Cost nothing. Okay, uh, so every restaurant, go to Bob Evans, eat eggs straight up. And why do you need to put salt on your eggs? And uh, you make grits or uh, oatmeal without eggs, without salt, and add fruits and add nuts. Um, it gives a natural taste. That's it. There are ways to do that. And it cost more money. So um, I... I know, Dr. Naravel, you're... you're is, I read that your, your daughter has been working on, who's also a surgeon, yes. has been working on a cookbook? Yes, she is. Uh, so uh, she's uh, com compiling recipes, inviting recipes, uh, and, and uh, she's going to publish that book very soon. Well, that'll be a good resource yeah, yeah. as well. Yes. Uh, she so. is. And I think uh, you can go back to your um, archives of uh, old fashioned recipes 
I can guarantee you that each one of them can be made healthy. Yes. And the taste can be altered. Just like my wife has done all the traditional Indian, South Indian uh, preparations of variety of kind that I've been given, handed over from generation to generation. She makes the same recipe without adding any salt and tastes great and healthy. And my wife is not an high blood pressure pulse. I'm not an high blood pressure pulse. But everybody else around us is an high blood pressure pulse. <laughs> as simple as that. Well, I, I put in the chat um, your uh, blog, saltkills.com, and the books, the two books that you have available, Salt Kills and Salt yeah. Black America Silent Killer. Um, if, yeah. if people want yes, to look at Thank those. you for doing that. And um, uh, I know uh, Marcia said thank you for the life saving information. She's greatly reduced her salt intake and is salt sensitive. I know that I am too. I know that my hands get swollen. If I if I've had too much salt, but I actually thought that my no salt was a good alternative. So I'll I'll definitely look into the um, Mrs. Dash because uh, I had kind of replaced that with a salt alternative. So if you don't recommend it, I'll see. I'll no, I would not recommend it. Sorry. Yeah, I would. I'll I'll see what else I can find, um, or and try and mm -hmm. cut back as much as we can. I do not but, recommend anything that has not has a mainstream med medical information uh, connected with it. Maybe something I sometimes I something I don't know. And I'm not willing to endorse based on my opinion. Okay, it has to be authentically. My son, who actually helped me write this uh, most of this stuff, is a researcher, a stickler, and he won't let me write anything that cannot be uh, verified. Okay, like he won't let me say a word that I cannot verify. So, Doctor, yes. Would you like to make a remark about sea salt versus regular salt? Uh, yes, I made that remark in passing. Uh, no, sea salt is absolutely, absolutely no. Sea salt is the same as a regular salt for all the bad things it does. And whether, whether it is a kosher salt, Celtic salt, pink salt, rock salt, Himalayan salt, any of those things, they are absolutely the same as a regular salt. They claim special elements present in these salts, okay? And first of all, there is a, that claim is most of the time not correct. Secondly, that's not how we get those salts anyway. All those things you should get from the natural sources. Well, like fruits and nuts and variety. Just like you don't eat salt to, to get sodium for your body, same way you don't get all those elements through eating salt. That's a wrong thing to do. And you get all the bad effects of eating regular salt. The industry knows that. They actually don't advertise saying that this is good for you. But they just market it in subtly to make you believe it is through celebrities and through subtle language. Uh, that's how they do that. No, I'm absolutely opposed to sea salt. So salt is salt, period. Salt is salt. Yeah. Whatever, whatever word that is before that, sea salt, kosher salt. There's a salt named after every culture and every um, um, ethnic group around, around the world to trick you into eating salt, just so they can sell more product. So the, on the screen, you have this picture about dancing couple versus boxing couple. That's what we are doing, going from this to this. And this is a scratch pad versus sponge that I was referencing. Sponge retains water, then you get a scratch pad automatically on the other side. Okay. Uh, so the hour is running late. I will take the last one or two questions, if any. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day, especially since you're, you're still at work uh, to, to talk with us. And um, I, I want to go back to your, your folder in the archives to make sure that we, we make it more robust. And um, I think eventually we want copies of your book here uh, for people to look at, but also for, because <laughs> we've, we've got stuff from the earliest doctor in the 1800s and, you know, we okay. try to represent everything throughout our history. So what you're, what you're preaching now to, to people is not going to be changing your, you know, your, your, your talking about, you know, it's not going to suddenly be that health is that salt is good for you. So this is, this will be one of those unchanging medical um, it, uh, recommendations and things that, that will, will forever be in our archives. We, we've got things over time where, you know, they've changed how, how they look at medicine, but this is not something that will change. And I think you've, um, I know you've opened my eyes to a lot of things today. Um, I knew, what things were bad for me, but you know. I wish you a lot of good health and uh, thank you for uh, helping out with this and you're helping citizens of Springfield. I've been a Clark County resident since 85. 
uh, almost 40 years now, 84 actually. I've been operating at Mercy and community hospitals almost 40 years now. I'm one of the senior most physicians in practice uh, and one of the longest surgeons in practice around. Uh, so my, I still enjoy doing surgery. I believe I bring some unique experience and talent to the table. I still do that. And, and I still enjoy operating. And I've done two heart surgeries today. So I keep doing that. Uh, so as long, I'm able to do that because I stop eating unhealthy. Otherwise, uh, good five, 10 years ago, I would have had to retire like most surgeons and just go around doctor's offices. <laughs> That's what doctors do, unfortunately. Most doctors don't eat uh, enjoy, enjoy their retirement. So that is, thank you very much, guys. I said, we, are, we are very lucky to have you here in Springfield to advocate for for people's health. And I know, um, I imagine you'll be at the minority health fair at the end of this month. Yes. Um, so April is minority health month. And I know that they have a fair on the 30th. Yes. Um, so you'll, you'll hard, Mary uh, is on the call. Uh, we, are, we have a good team and we're working so hard and we could use any help in promoting this uh, event. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to share it. And I hope that you're able to reach a lot of people with your message because yes. um, it is very important. And I see uh, Mary Ann, you got to move over a little bit more. <laughs> Other direction. There she is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mary Ann's trying to show her T-shirt. Um, that's that's related to our, our next virtual program um, okay. that we'll have in, next month. And we'll be talking a bit more about the Heritage Center and how, how you okay. can continue to support uh, history uh, and our building. Um, but our, we have another program in May that will be with uh, Rabbi uh, Carrie Cosberg about the um, local Jewish history. So those are our upcoming virtual programs. Sure. Thank you very much for accommodating me. So I like to come you. here from time to time to refresh with new information and new way to explain things. You know, yes. I like to do that. So thank you so much for, for everybody for coming tonight. And thank you, Dr. Naravella, for, for talking with us. Thank and you again. We'll, we'll help to spread this message to help people be healthy. Thank you. Natalie, uh, Natalie, I just wanted to tell you, I was just too hot and I was trying to get my sweater off without making a scene. <laughs> but uh, we have voted and we voted for the Historical Society. So we've already done it. Appreciate you, Marianne. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. And thank I hope you, you have, night, have a great everybody. day. Thanks again. I'm going to log out. Thank you very much.